Welcome to the I Believe Podcast, an Acure Insight production, brought to you by Castle Biosciences. I'm your host, Danae Peterson, a fellow ocular melanoma survivor. Here on the podcast, we'll be sharing information and insights on treatments, research, and living with ocular melanoma. Castle Biosciences tests are designed to provide clinicians precise and personalized tumor information for the benefit of patient care. If you would like more information about how Castle is transforming the treatment of eye cancer, visit castletestinfo.com. All right, you guys, I wanted to just um, bring on a special guest today, and he's actually my personal naturopath oncologist, and so I'm grateful that he was willing to volunteer his time to just have a discussion with us here on the I Believe podcast. Um, for those of you joining us live, I'm your host, Danae Peterson, and uh, I am here with Dr. Dan Rubin, who is a naturopath doctor and D, and he is also an FABNO, which I'm going to let him explain what that means. Mm. Um, but we are going to have a discussion today about integrative oncology and what this looks like, what it can look like, um, kind of where the practice started, at least for Dr. Rubin. Uh, we did have another guest. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us today, just kind of last minute. So we're just going to move forward with Dr. Rubin and we're grateful for your time. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So um, Dr. Rubin, you are located in Scottsdale, correct? Yep. We're in Scottsdale, Arizona. We've been practicing in Arizona for almost 26 years now. Okay. And we're right here. At, we It's really nice because we're a naturopathic oncology clinic and we're on a hospital campus on the Honor Health campus, which, of course, you know. But for those of you listening, I think it's a, it's really nice to be on a hospital campus. It lends validity and legitimacy to what we do. And it also lets us integrate more closely because, I mean, right outside this window here, there's probably five or six oncology practices and a big research center. So kind of right smack dab in the heart of oncology in Scottsdale. No, I love it. And honestly, that was the reason that I found you as a patient was because my oncologist team recommended your team as a naturopath doctor. Um, and they just, they just said that you had a good reputation. Your practice had a good reputation. And that if I was going to seek integrative care, that I should do it with someone reputable and someone who was well-established. Um, yeah, so that's tell us, that's true. Oh, oh, I was just was going to say, oh, tell was... us a little more about how you got started on like this journey as a naturopath doctor and a specifically an oncologist. <clears throat> Oh, so literally how I got started to naturopathic medicine, uh, it happened in Iowa City, Iowa. I was uh, I had moved back to my college town because I'm from Chicago, went to school at University of Iowa and graduated with a degree in existential philosophy, and <clears throat> which I think is a great degree for what I do now because I, every day I create arguments as to why we have to approach each person individually, where they are and how they are. And, and we create this argument, which philosophy is obviously a form of argumentation um, and problem solving. And uh, I had moved back to train for triathlon. This is in the early 90s. I met my original mentor, Dr. Ephraim Lansky, who at right at the time when I was getting ready to move again back to Chicago so I could take my prerequisites for naturopathic medical school since I had a philosophy degree and no science background. Dr. Lansky moved out to Israel uh, and he started growing, he started a pomegranate farm and started uh, growing organic pomegranates and started a whole company, an anti-cancer company for, with pomegranates. We're still in contact today, but he wrote me my original recommendation, and he told me about naturopathic medical school. Now, Dr. Lansky was an MD and a PhD and encouraged me to go down the road of MD and kind of follow what he did because he was so, so interested in integrative medicine. He was one of the originals, a true, true original, because this is early 90s. He had homeopathics. He had Chinese herbs. He practiced Qigong. He was so already doing this stuff. And his office was uh, next or uh, adjacent to the health food store that I was working in told me about Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine, helped me on my way. He mentored me. I went back to Chicago. I took a bunch of science classes and voila, I got in and started naturopathic medical school. I graduated in 1997. <clears throat> Had an interest in oncology the whole time, but I didn't really know it. What I was really interested in was the biochemical and anatomical and physiological intricacies of the body, for, literally from beginning to end, meaning from embryology, from how things developed, all the way to how can we take care of the disease state. 
And I found that really one of the greatest and lasting mysteries of the human body lay in oncology. I just naturally drifted towards it. And so I graduated in 1997 and did a residency in naturopathic medicine. At that point, we didn't have any specialty anywhere. It was actually uh, unprofessional conduct to refer to yourself in this state of Arizona as a specialist. So as I sort of moved through my career, I wasn't, I couldn't call myself a naturopathic oncologist. And so we sort of had to develop, we had to develop that process, which I'm happy to talk about too. But yeah, that's how I found that. That's how I found myself in 1994, entering into naturopathic school. I guess my journey technically, technically started in 1991 in Iowa City, when Dr. Lansky recognized my predilection for the interest of what I was working at a health food store. I guess I didn't mention that. And <clears throat> doing triathlon, I was interested in how I could improve performance with my body, nutrition. He saw that and he pointed me in the right direction. And then fast forward, I graduate school in 1997. I start practicing. I get a really, really interested uh, in the immune system at the time. I uh, started out, I, I did a one-year residency in family medicine. That's all we had, but I sort of became known as the cancer guy, if you will, um, the, the doctor. I, and that I was, nobody was, not nobody, there was very few people doing that at the time that were really yeah, for sure. in, engaging in oncology. And so um, I, I just took to it and I got really interested and people started referring me patients and just started building on that. And uh then started working with a gentleman now, uh, his name is Dr. Neil Reardon. Uh, Neil and I worked together. We did a lot of immune therapy. And back in the late 90s, we were actually making some autologous vaccines. It was highly technical, highly conserved, highly scientific work that we were doing out of, in here in Arizona. Um, really became really familiar with immune pathways. And I still hold that knowledge, you know, in my heart. And I, I still use it today. And how I feel about the immune system is sort of like your true first and last defense uh, against cancer. From there, I, uh, after, um, after him and I had parted ways, I started my own clinic. That was 2004. And that's when I really realized that if we're going to protect the public, which is what I had taken an oath to, to get my license, that we had to protect the public. Cancer diagnoses were on the rise. Consumption by the public, by consumers of naturopathic medicine related to oncology was on the rise. And oncology was a fast moving beast. It's still fast moving, but that was really one, part of the acceleration points. Late 90s, early 2000s, technology was starting to get ahead of medicine. Medicine was then catching up to technology. More classes of medicines were coming out. It was just growing. And we had to find a way to let the public know that there are true experts out there. There are people who focus in oncology, not see five patients or three patients or 10 patients a year with cancer, but people who really focus on it. And that's when we launched the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians and its professional, that's the organization arm, the membership mm -hmm. arm. It's called the ONC A N P, O N C A N P, and then we 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 the board certification arm was called the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. So F A B N O, which you had mentioned at the beginning of this uh, production, stands for Fellow to the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology, and so that's somebody who has met the criteria to become fellow, and now I have that designation, and I can refer to myself as a specialist in the state of Arizona. I have the very first oncology specialist certificate, I think, ever issued by the board. It's 001. It's hanging on my wall right there. If anybody comes in my office, be very proudly showing it off. Uh, and uh, that was an effort that was launched initially by myself and my dear friend, Dr. Jason Harmon, as a naturopathic oncologist up in Anchorage, Alaska. And Anke MP was born. I was the founding president and retained presidency, or sorry, re negative connotation to the word retain, remained president for the first five years. After that, uh, the board grew, another president took over, and here we are, if 04, so we're on year, we're over 19 years in 2023. And actually tomorrow, we're uh, Dr. Coates and I are headed out to the annual convention in Toronto. Uh, the oh, first awesome. year that we're all getting together since 2020. So very proudly going there. So very thanks for asking about it and uh, caring about it, because that was really the birthplace 
and the invention of the naturopathic oncologist. So I love the background here, and I think it's so important because I think that it's incredibly valuable to understand that a naturopathic doctor has a ton of schooling, a ton of an understanding of the science behind the body as a whole, and also a naturopathic oncologist, um, someone who has this FABNO certification, they have even further, you know, like they're just, again, like you said, they're a specialist. They completely narrow their focus to um, the window that is cancer or the umbrella that is cancer. Cause obviously there's so many cancers and I know for a fact that you see tons mm-hmm. of different types of cancers. You don't just see mm-hmm. one type. Uh, but can you talk to us a little bit why, why it works for you as an integrative mm-hmm. oncologist to see various different types of cancers versus someone who like I see across the street, I see a nap or I see a uveal melanoma specialist who specifically focuses on my cancer in the medical field. Um, what allows you to be able to kind of have that overarching, you know, reach to reach all of these patients? Sure. So I, uh, that's a great question. And I think you're, you're talking about subspecialty or kind of, you know, I look at all doctors are doctors, all physicians that see patients, and then they specialize. They're a naturopathic doctor, an osteopathic doctor, an MD, an allopathic doctor, a chiropractic doctor, doctor of dentistry. You know, then we have our specialty. Then we start to subspecialize. And so I'm a naturopathic oncologist. And so I'm, I'm guessing that your uveal melanoma specialist is an ophthalmologist, so a subspecialist, and then even a sub-subspecialist when they're seeing people with uveal melanoma. And that's just so incredibly specialized. But in the world of naturopathic oncology, there isn't a lot of people with uveal melanoma seeing me, or ocular melanoma seeing me. So I've had three patients in my career. So obviously... I wouldn't be able to make a practice out of seeing three patients. Even if I put myself out there as I'm going to be the specialist, there simply isn't enough known, proven trial trials, things that we can use to really attend to it because you have the conventional way, which gives the main treatment, whether it be radiation therapy, whether it be a drug therapy or I mean, uh, a surgery, these are going to be main treatments that are going to be stronger than what I can do as a naturopathic oncologist, specifically for uveal melanoma. So I can't be a specialist in that area. It just, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fit um, in terms of just, you know, patient flow and being able yeah, to. Yeah. Just having, having enough practice. patients to be able to have a practice for sure. Yeah. Well, and I also, think even like really... a, even like an, a, an ocular oncologist who sees people with ocular melanoma for the eye, they also mostly, most of them, I know they see people for other retina issues and retina diseases, um, retinoblastoma, you know, there's a various different kind of subspecialties that they see within their practice. And so that makes sense. Um, I don't know what what else I was getting at, but in general, in general, well, I was going to continue to explain how integrative sort of oncology works and, you know, how we find our practices in general in, in the community. At, at what we'll call regular cancer centers, open to the public, non-academic centers. You're usually going to have people who focus, doctors who focus on a certain type. They may be sort of breast specialists, but they're open to general oncology because you, they may get a referral for somebody with colon cancer or something like that. Uh, and then you have your doctors who may specialize in lymphoma or hematological cancers, and they focus on that. There's huge amounts of data and new drugs that are being developed and method, and they're constantly focused on that. And to keep up with that and the NCCN guidelines, insurance parameters, and all the things that they have to keep up with and how they have to give their care, they really do have to specialize. And it's a great thing because they're focused. They know what didn't work, they know what's coming up, and they know what's working right now, and 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 all the different di- differentiation aspects of that. In naturopathic medicine, we simply don't have tools like they do in conventional oncology, and the processes that we work with, the the biological processes, how we view a patient, are somewhat similar across solid tumors. And then they differ a little when you get to blood and lymph cancers. And then based on where the organ is, you're going to do different things with, with, with certain people, whether you have a lesion in the eye, whether it's you know a liver primary, a lymphoma primary, or a colon pri- or prostate primary. The diets are going to be different. The supplements you're going to reach for are going to be different. The IVs, the, you know, and then it's where they are in their conventional care. That's going to be a different approach. Say you have somebody that has completed all their conventional care and they're in the no evidence of disease uh, realm. 
they can't, they're being monitored, they're at risk for recurrence, but nobody can find anything, and they're coming up to us to prevent recurrence. Well, the approach is going to be, we're going to see how you differ in your own self by testing your physiology, doing a suite of tests, and then we're going to approach it not from a disease perspective per se, but from a, hey, this happened to you, you went through a bunch of treatment, you're physiologically different than you were at diagnosis because you've gone through treatment. And at diagnosis, you were physiologically different than you were 20 years prior. And, you know, if this is an adult. And so how do we, that the approach to that person is vastly different than the approach to the person who has a newly diagnosed pancreatic lesion, who's now deciding on what treatment they're going to do versus a person with a 1.5 centimeter malignant breast lesion is going to be very different than the person with metastatic colon cancer or you know, a recurrent lymphoma. And so because the principles of the approach to the person of naturopathic medicine are, we go by a series of principles, we can then see people with different diagnoses and approach them with a similar philosophy, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. Um, and I think that it just, it goes kind of, it goes back to what you said at the beginning, how that was one of the the primary things that fascinated you the most was just really trying to understand, you know, the physiologic um, makeup of the body, the immune system of each individual person, and just recognizing just how individual that is from person to person, like a fingerprint or like our, you know, like our DNA makeup, like all of those things, like we are such individual people. And so I think that what I have gotten out of just learning more about integrative oncology as a whole is just that the goal is to look at the big picture versus when you have a specialist who is like a uveal melanoma medical oncologist, their job is to niche focus. They have to, that's, that's their job. That's where their focus has to be. Like you said, to keep up with current trials, to keep up with the the fast moving research, um, all of those things. There's, there's a reason and a purpose behind that. But when you have, an integrative oncologist or a, a functional or naturopathic doctor who is really heavily focused on your whole your whole self and kind of understanding the big picture of okay you have cancer here but what else is going on in your body and what can we do to address you know a b and c that's happening in your body that may or may not be contributing but but generally if we improve these things it's going to improve your whole self it's going to improve your whole body um, your whole health like you said your your performance or your, just your i think generally quality of life is such an important and valuable thing um, to so many people who are going through cancer um, so can you talk let's just talk a little bit about um, as you approach cancer management with various different patients in your practice um, you have kind of alluded to a few of the ways that you approach this process so um, And I know it, like you said, it differs from kind of how the patient presents, where they are in their cancer diagnosis journey. Um, But let's just say you're dealing with someone who either is newly metastatic, um, like as in they have had primary treatment. And in our community, that primary treatment happens in the eye. Um, But you're dealing with someone who is primary treated already and there has been recurrence or someone who is, um, what did you call it? Um, no evidence of disease. Someone who is, you know, currently monitoring but doesn't have any uh, any any further recurrence yet, but they have kind of that threat of it coming back. Um, what are like kind of some of the main things you do to start when you see a patient, and what's the science behind that? I guess. So if uh, well, the science is the N of one. The science is in the testing. So let's say we oh, let's just take. Uh, 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 well, let's take somebody with ocular melanoma or uveal melanoma who is no evidence of disease. What are we going to do? How are we going to decide what to do? I, there isn't a compendium of things that we've tried in the past that we can access and say, you know what, you fit into this category. So I'm going to pick these three treatments for you. The problem with that is even if there was, how would, or even if we wanted to establish a compendium, how would we go about it? You may have a different blood type. You may be a different age, a different gender. Your lesion may be a different size. It may have happened for a different reason. You have different life circumstances. You certainly have different physiology. And you may have used certainly different treatments. So that's been my problem and my beef, if you will, with research. I'm not saying I don't appreciate research. I'm saying that I'm not one that focuses on researches for my career and only relying on research studies to approach my patients because that annihilates my creativity. And without creativity in naturopathic medicine, I'm annihilated. 
I'm not a good doctor anymore. No, that makes sense. Why? Because I start my approach by trying to understand who's in front of me. That's why we have questionnaires. It's why we ask about diet. It's why I take a history. And the history isn't just, tell me your about cancer your cancer history. You know, your, your cancer history, it's how did this start for you? What do you want to do? Do you want to live? I mean, these are reasonable questions. What do you eat? Tell me about your day. And then we begin an investigation. So we try and do as much urine testing, stool testing, blood testing, saliva testing to get a feel for the person's physiology to see if we can, number one, pick out perturbances or find patterns that we need to correct to mm -hmm. optimize bring that physiology into alignment with what we at our clinic consider more optimal. That's number one. Number two, follow-up slash subsequent testing is to try and pick out uh, perturbances that are now happening that may lead us in the direction of that smelling smoke in the basement. There may be something trying to recur. There may be a cancer cell that is trying to say hello, so to speak, and we, we already know that this person is at risk for recurrence, which is why they're coming to see us, which is why they're under surveillance anyhow. So if we can find something biochemically or physiologically, and then we can suppress that, maybe we can suppress the, the appearance of that cancer cell otherwise, like on a scan or via a symptom, and maybe mm -hmm. we can get it to die, die off. That's how we approach the person. If And if we're good enough, if we can find it, if we're good enough, and this person is actually... Uh, at risk for recurrence and about to have a recurrence, we're pretty good at finding this stuff. It's mm -hmm. pretty amazing when you develop, like we've developed panels of tests, but not only that, the way that you interpret them, this is where experience comes in. And this is what sets naturopathic oncologists apart from those who are not naturopathic oncologists, period, the end. Whether you're an integrative doctor, a functional doctor, a naturopathic doctor, into nutrition, if you're not experienced in oncology, and you don't know how to read things and really understand the true underlying and fundamental principles and practice of oncology, you're probably going to miss stuff. I'm not saying people shouldn't go see other physicians. I'm saying if you're looking for a true expert in this realm, you got to find somebody who this is what they do all day. I don't do anything else in my practice except see people of all ages with cancer. That's what I've done. I've been doing it for 26 years. Um, so that's why we developed that board certification. That's where the protection and consumerism comes in. So yeah. people know what FABNO means and that this is somebody, they, you know, we had to reach that criteria. And not everybody who has FABNO after their ND sees 100% of their patients, 100% uh, of their practices in oncology, but most of them do. And that's where you get the experience. It's the same thing. You're not going to an MD oncologist or a DO oncologist who also does family practice on the side or as half their practice. I mean, yeah, that just you want, doesn't you want the specialty, so, you want the specialization, you want the experience, like you said. And, ex, and ex, yeah, experience and expertise is really key, especially in these difficult cases and mm -hmm. treatment. So I mean, test selection, treatment selection, advice giving, you know, we've got to balance, you know, people can only spend so much time or money or effort. And so you really got to know what you're doing and, you know, put these things together. And I, I fit into the experience world. And I do believe that I know what I'm doing. Um, well, and, and I, I think it helps too, like as, as a patient, like coming to a doctor who is confident in their practice, who is confident in what they do, yeah. that, that makes a big difference in, especially when you're dealing with cancer. And I think that we've talked about this in my appointments before, where we just, I've, I've just mentioned that one of the most challenging things that I believe around a cancer diagnosis is that there is obviously a huge negative stigma around the word cancer, um, which understandably, I, I, I can see that, but I think that there's a huge level of fear that happens. You get that metastatic diagnosis or that initial diagnosis of, you know, whatever, whatever cancer it is. And in our case, this eye cancer, and then fear creeps in and fear when, when we're making decisions from a place of fear medically, I just, I think that it does us it does us a disservice um, in our care, and so I think that trying to remove the fear and just kind of take that step back, um, I think that in coming to see you, like and and just trying to find someone who would really try to understand me as a person, that was why it was so valuable, is because it helped it helped bring some understanding and bringing understanding removed some of the layers of fear around the metastatic diagnosis, 
And awesome. once education. that fear was, yeah, that education, that it was super empowering. Um, so I know we can't go into like every single test that you do in your panel, but what are maybe just a couple of some of those hallmarker <clears throat> cancer markers that you look at or that you just want to see um, in a blood test? And what are like, what are maybe same, let's just look at like five of the names of those blood tests that you oh. go through. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of what we do, we try and run just through regular commercial labs that you have out there, Quest or Sedora Quest or LabCorp, you know, the big ones or those that contract through those and, um, and you know, for insurance generally pays for theirs or, or we can negotiate good prices. So, and uh, just naming five. So we have interleukin-8, VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor, matrix metalloproteinase. We have some immune profiles, uh, interleukin-6, we have the insulin-like growth factors. I'm on my other hand right now. Um, <laughs> transforming growth factor beta one. You know, it, it's not just looking at the raw value. It's looking at the pattern. So what I what I say, I always say, I may draw 26 vials of blood on somebody, and it may be I don't know 35 different blood tests, but that's one blood test to me because it's one stick, one time, and one person, same mm -hmm. blood. That's one blood test. And what I'm all about stories. What story is that telling me today in association with a follow-up scan, where they are in their journey, how they're feeling, how, what they're eating, how they're sleeping, how they're exercising, their interpersonal relationships, how much they're laughing, what type of nature bathing they're getting. All of that matters. These are not questions nor tests that you will see done in a traditional oncology clinic. That's where there's gaps. Integrative oncology recognizes and does recognizes those gaps and fills those gaps. The bigger the experience, the bigger the confidence, the bigger the skill set, the bigger the gap that gets filled. Mm. It is a recognized thing that there are gaps. Now, let's take not every case. Let's say that somebody has a go back a uh, uh, a point a, a nine millimeter okay a one point two centimeter breast cancer ductal or an intraductal carcinoma infiltrating ductal carcinoma it's estrogen positive it was biopsied and it gets removed and it's clean and this person has enough breast tissue that they can get good margins and it was low grade it didn't score very high on certain tests and it wasn't very aggressive and now it's gone. The lymph nodes were negative. That may be somebody that then goes on like an anti-estrogen pill and doesn't come and see a naturopathic doctor and is cured. Was probably cured by surgery, maybe. Goes on anti-estrogen. And they may end up going to the internet and looking at a diet or consulting a nutritionist and not seeing the doctor. And they may end up doing okay. But there's way more people that don't. And part of the problem is all the hype on social media. And I feel comfortable talking about it because I talked about it last night on my Instagram live because every the second Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. Arizona time, I do an Instagram live where I do a question and answer. Ask me anything it's called. And our other doctors here also go on Instagram live at different times. But one of the, one of the things that was brought up and was also mentioned afterwards by some of the listeners was I won't give medical advice. People ask questions. There was somebody who had asked a question about a certain type of cancer that, that had just been diagnosed, the size of it, and what should they do? I can't answer that question. I can't give anybody medical advice if I don't know their case. And that's what real doctors do. And there's a lot of info that a lot of people get on social media or off the internet that is treatment advice and it's not necessarily fit for them and they get into trouble. And so I'm actually here. That's not integrative medicine. That's not responsible medicine. It's not even medicine. It's just hype. And so yeah. part well, of and that's mission, definitely something I, that we experience on social media too. Like as patients is we've got all these Facebook groups and, and you ask for advice and then you get 50 bazillion different answers from all these different people who, like you said, they have different experiences. They have different physiological makeups um, and just and it's, it's not to say that, you know, doing something that Sally over here does that is a healthy thing is going to be, ne you know, necessarily a bad thing for you to do as a patient. But when you don't have that specialized look at you as a person from a doctor who knows what they're doing, who has that experience, then 
there, there are those gaps and you don't have, you don't have the higher chance that those gaps are filled um, when you're not seeing the doctor is kind of what I, that's what I look at it as just my personal perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's getting worse. And, and the, the reason I know it is because I see what people come in taking. I have a case is famous. This is probably 12 years ago, or at least 12 years ago. Patient came in, was brought to my practice, to the visit. They came with their naturopathic doctor, who was the referring doctor. And this person had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and was very proud that they were on a protocol that they got from the internet. And I took one look at it and I said, this is a prostate cancer protocol. This is not a pancreatic cancer protocol. And they're like, no, I went online. I, t- I even called the people. I bought all the stuff they assured me. So sure enough, I go online and it's the, all the, everything they're doing is listed under their prostate protocol. So I, I, what I was saying is I started this in 2004 with the mission to protect the public. And here we are in mid-2003, uh, 2023. And we're still having to protect the public because things are getting egregious and they're out there. And so uh, you're doing the right thing. We're, you know, we're doing the right thing by going about it responsibly. This is cancer that we're talking mm-hmm. about. This isn't something else. No, I, I totally get that. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk about two things. Um, I want to talk about the metabolism of a cancer cell. And I also want to talk about, like, from from your understanding and kind of if you could just explain that, like, what is the metabolism of a healthy cell versus a cancer cell? And then I want to talk about the immune system. I know you're really passionate about that, so we'll save that for last. Yeah. You know, metabolism or cancer as a metabolic disease is a huge buzz phrase nowadays. And I, it, I, I think it's starting to be misconstrued. Because any cancer cell arises within oneself and it grows within oneself and it's part of oneself. Philosophically speaking, it just is. So the strategy is how do you kill off a little part of oneself without killing off the self? Well, when you really look at it, cancer, I call it a big, dumb warrior. It gets big sometimes, you know, if you let it grow. It's a warrior because it's fight, fight, fight. It tries to stay alive, but it's the dumbest thing because its goal is to kill itself. How? Because if you let it grow, it kills the person that it's in. It's part of itself. It's trying to kill itself. So well, that makes sense. I've never looked at it that way. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's absolutely true. And so how do, you, how do you try and outsmart or, first of all, kill off a little part of something by giving something to the person, whether it be IV or oral or external beam radiation therapy? How do you use a medicine? Because with medicines, for the most part, you're throwing it into the wild you know, stick a needle in the arm, swallow it, it's getting there. You know, it's different if you have a direct infusion of a certain chemotherapy or direct installation into a tumor, which there's movement towards that now, and it's a beautiful thing, or another kind of direct treatment. But that's a strategy. And so cancer has to be a metabolic disease because it's of a living cell. But the movement was really recognizing the way in which cancer utilizes calories and that one of the hallmarks of cancer, there's I think 19 recognized hallmarks of cancer, meaning things that really describe a cancer cell that you can't really use to describe a normally functioning cell, like changes in the blood vessel growth, changes in you know certain upregulated molecules, re- resistance to the immune system, surveillance. And one of these things is how they utilize calories in the body. And calories, we mean sugars. And in general, I think it's fair to say that cancer is about 18 times less efficient at using calories than a normal cell is. So it's going to require more input of calories for its growth. This is very raw, excuse me, you know, simplified, good understanding. But cancer is also a hypermetabolic disease. So it's metabolism, it's activity, if you will, it's growth kinetics is higher than a normal cell is. So that then again, sets it even higher. So first it's 18 times less efficient. So it needs more calories. Then it uses more just by virtue of, because it's hypermetabolic. So it consumes a lot of these calories. So um, the movement towards like the keto diet per se, which I think we could probably have a rich discussion about in your experience with that. 
um, is an effort to try and limit the amount of simple carbs and just carbohydrates that are available for the metabolism of cancer cell. Because in general, the cancer cell cannot use the ketone bodies that are generated through a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. Although the brain and the heart and the rest of the human body, the normal cells, enjoy the ketones. Yeah, it's sure. historic. You know, no, it's, it's are... absolutely amazing, like understanding the science mm -hmm. behind that. Um, and I apologize. I want to show, I want to show something that I actually got from Patricia Daly, who she's a, she's a nutritionist who specializes in, um, kind of keto and really just metabolic, but she shared this. And I, I think that you've probably have seen something like this. Um, but I want to share it because I think it's a good visual for our listeners just to see the difference between. And this is, this is stuff that we can, we can agree. I think science across the board, whether you're a, a naturopathic doctor or an oncology doctor who went to, you know, med school for, for uveal melanoma or whatever it is like that we can all agree that this is the way that cancer cells look on a cellular level. Um, and I think that this is super nifty. So I'm going to show this really fast. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. So what it has over here is it's showing like the duplication and it's showing kind of the, I think it was, it was an attempt by um, Dr. Thomas Seafried to just demonstrate the difference between the idea in, you know, conventional medicine, kind of the polar opposites, right? Because there's, I think there's, there's those polar opposites in medicine where we've got one side of medicine wants to approach cancer from strictly the DNA standpoint and say, well, there's just something genetically wrong with the cell. We just have to fix that or we have to turn it off or, you know, whatever it is. And so, um, I'm, I guess I'll just explain this and then I'll, you can correct me if there's anything wrong, but the normal cells, they duplicate and there's their mitochondria or the little beans. And then you've got the nucleus is the circle and you've got a tumor cell with unhealthy mitochondria and, um, the big kind of differences here was when you get the healthy cell with healthy mitochondria and, and a tumor nucleus and it duplicates and it continues to duplicate normal cells versus when you have the healthy nucleus and you have unhealthy mitochondria, the common factor here is the mitochondria, like is what I'm, that's, that's what I was super fascinated to see was just this idea that, okay, the, when the mitochondria are in check or in charge, then the cell stays it stays healthy versus when the DNA is healthy and the mitochondria are not, then you're likely to have that, that tumor cell. Um, is that like a reasonable explanation? Well, you got it out of the book, so I better not argue. <laughs> I know it's right in the book. That's true. I'm just explaining the picture. Um, but oh, it's, I guess I just was fascinating to me that idea that like just the, on a cellular level, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if the nucleus is healthy, if the, if the mitochondria are not, and the, the way the cell metabolizes energy and uses energy, that hypermetabolic state that you mentioned, then that cell will continue to perpetuate unhealthy cells. Um, so I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, so that's kind of been my reasoning, at least personally for wanting to do, like you said, the ketogenic diet is just trying to help keep those unhealthy mitochondria from having access to anything to keep them growing. Um, so from a, like from a metabolic state or a, a metabolic standpoint, um, what are a couple of the different things that you like using, um, or kind of having patients pay attention to in that area? And then we can move over to the immune system. Cause I know that's a, that's a big one too. You know, the, the key that needs to be said here, if we're talking about metabolism is adaptation. And my good friend and colleague, Dr. Greg Nye, and I have been talking about the theory of adaptation, which a cancer cell will adapt to a ketogenic diet, just like it will adapt to it. It adapts. It's why it becomes resistant. Just like a bacteria can you know, become mm, yeah. resistant. To, oh, that makes sense. To, uh, so what's important is to test and to understand the patient so we know when to switch a treatment. And that's mm -hmm. part of where this testing comes in. And what I was calling smoke in the basement is when you can start to see a shift away from optimal, even if mm -hmm. it's just a couple millimeters, and that's where the experience comes in, then you know it might be time to switch. And so there's, there, I will, and I need to say this, there are plenty of people out there who will not do well on a ketogenic diet. It is 100% not the right diet for many people out there. And I know that there are many doctors out there who that's what they promote. And they say, absolutely, you have cancer, you have to go keto. And I'm not one of those doctors. And I'm taking this opportunity to say that because I have to protect the public. It's what I do. 
And I think it's part of the hype. And I don't think that that science, no, I know that that science doesn't work for everybody because I see it in my practice routinely. So we do have to be careful in suggesting, which is why I don't give advice and say, so like what we do with diet here is we have a host of diets that we can pick from. And it depends. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily pick a diet for somebody until we get to know them a little bit and then decide this. It might be a true low carb diet, which is kind of like what people say, a modified keto. Um, and it might be a plant forward, eat all the carbs you want. And it might be a blood type specific diet. It might be a balanced 40, 30, 30 diet. And it might be an ancestral diet or it might be a mitochondrial diet. So there's such thing as a mito diet put forth by the Institute of Functional Medicine. And so you talked about mitochondria. And so we actually test mitochondria here. And so it's very difficult. So you can do it by looking at organic acids in the urine, which gives you sort of a, sort of like peeking in the window. Or we have a test here that uses a buccal swab and it is something that we can actually look at what's called the electron transport chain because there's three phases to the mitochondrial function. And you have to take into account all of them, but really the electron transport chain, which is the end all be all, which is where the bulk of your energy and your ATP is created. Because when you're talking about mitochondria, mm-hmm. you're talking about energy production. So anyhow, without getting too scientific, how do you change that? Well, one of the big things that we do, we use a lot of ozone therapy in something called EBU, EB0, EBOO extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozonation we use lifestyle we use certain supplements i really don't want to talk about the supplements here because no, the supplements are so specific to the person for sure yeah thank you um and then sometimes people don't need those fixed sometimes it's not the mitochondria and so it's there's a lot of attention being paid to mitochondria. We have some very specific, what we call full-fledged mitochondrial programs here. And sometimes, especially if somebody's not very functional, very fatigued, has trudged through a lot of conventional mm-hmm. treatment, then we just go right into, we have to go right into a full mitochondrial program because those people need to be revived or resurrected, so to speak. And sometimes it's just, you know, things that we pick up. So anyhow, without getting too in-depth and um, jeopardizing the time, I, I'll stop there. No, I think that's good. And I think that that gives kind of just a general view of like, okay, yes, like you said, diet can be a factor, but it also, it really isn't the only one. Okay. Are you still there? Diet is, it's a, it, yeah. Oh, you're good. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, diet's a huge one. I mean, it's what we put in our body. And so, you know, we start with diet, precepts of diet. Like for instance, the most important thing to us is quality of the food. That's where we start, no. nutrient dense, you know, good food. And then we start our precepts from there. So anyhow, so I agree with you. Diet is important. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about immune system. And yeah. um, let's just talk about, you know, what do you as a naturopathic oncologist like to do to boost the immune system? What are, what are a few of the strategies you might use with various different patients? And obviously it's going to differ from patient to patient. Um, but I know that like that that also look, you're, you're looking at like the response of the patient to the different, you know, the different therapies, the different supplements, um, what, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but what's the importance of the immune system in cancer from your perspective? So first, so first of all, and I didn't coin this term, but it's, it's, it's several decades old, but I believe it was Candace Pert who said, your immune system can hear everything you think. So that's where I start. Laughter, sleep, interpersonal relationships, nature bathing, three-dimensional viewing. This is a 2D screen, Mm, right? And it gives off electromagnetic fields. Whereas out here in those mountains out there, that's three-dimensional. So I can have a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional thing, but it's still not 3D. And it's a digital representation of an analog object. That is important for brain, and that's what your immune system is used to because your immune system isn't used to all the EMF and Wi-Fi and everything that we have around us and the electrochemical smog and the toxins and the less minerals in our water and the food that is you know, bereft of you know, nutrients. dense nutrition. Yeah. All. So that's where we start with, I like to call it treating the body how we all know a body should be treated, or at least we should know how it's supposed to be treated. And if you don't, that's part of our job as naturopathic doctors in this clinic to educate you on that. Medicine's coming after that. But most of the people nowadays in 2023 that are coming to the naturopathic oncology office, 
have a jump start on that. And they understand that because we've got great things like social media, great information out there that they can consume about diet. And so we don't have to start there with a lot of people because they found that out for themselves and they've had intelligent consumption uh, with filters of this. So that's obviously a benefit of social media and the internet is that uh, we talked about sort of some of the negative aspects. So I do want to touch upon the positive aspects because they're definitely out there. No, and there's sure. people giving great information out there. And it's uh, for me, for me, my personal and, pro and professional opinion is those that are out there giving information, but not causing people to go under a treatment plan that may not be fit for the, them. Again, this is my personal professional philosophy of how to approach a person with cancer is that it has to be individualized and it has to be under medical care. But talking about precepts of nutrition and uh, you know how, treating a human body, how all bodies should be treated in general, that's good information. And that's yeah, how we that's start the immune sure. system because it can hear what you think. And so if you're depending on what you're thinking is probably how your immune system is going to be acting. And then we would test the immune system. And we have, we have several blood tests that can directly test the function of various parts of the immune system and test the, the relative presence of how many at that time floating through that vein at one time point of what <laughs> in that of one day you that have. you take that test. <laughs> yes. And that's, that is a, that is a thing that one needs to take into account. And that's why serial testing is important is so you establish trends and you look at patterns because it is true. It's one time, one person, one stick, one part of the day, what if it was a bad day? What if you didn't sleep that well? What if you had a crappy breakfast? What if you didn't exercise? What if you? What did if that? you had your scans the day before and then you went and got your blood tests and it yes, and so threw we off do the, try you know, and plan. threw off the values, like yeah, yes, and so we we understand that, and there are certain tests that, and not only that, but if I let's say I order a blood test and let's say it's fifteen vials of blood, and the last vials of blood that were taken, there's certain um, blood tests. That when you have a needle dwelling in your arm for a certain amount of time, that will raise certain values. And so you have to be able to read that or else you could be giving somebody a false positive. Mm, so no, that makes sense. back to the immune system. So what do we do for the immune system? So we treat what we find. Uh, for instance, sometimes we don't need to find or we don't have time to find. Let's say somebody comes to me and they are starting a course of radiation therapy for whatever reason. And let's say it's longer than, let's say it's longer than eight days. Let's say it's four weeks of radiation. Um, or even three weeks. Anything, anything past eight to ten days, we're going to be scratch that. Anything with radiation, we're going to be treating the immune system. But we generally get into a larger protocol once we pass eight to eleven days. Okay. Why? Because the immune here's our here's the theory on it. If you're getting radiation, you're doing so because you have the chance that there's a cancer cell that needs to be killed or immortalized, stopped from replicating. And the way a cancer cell will die in response to successful radiation is via and through a mechanism that will then render that cancer cell seeable by the immune system. So it behooves you to have a functional immune system right before or at least during radiation so it can go get that cancer cell that's dying and get that information from that cancer cell and then retain that information. Hmm. So basically get, get the... the um... Like get the memo, so to speak, of like, hey, get the memo. This this cancer it. cell over here, you didn't see it before, but radiation is now targeting it, and because radiation is targeting it, it becomes visible oh. to the body's immune system. If it's visible to the body's 100%. immune system, then your immune system can go to work and attack it the way that it was supposed to when it was hiding. <laughs> yes, but then one would say, well, what's the use? The cell's dying anyhow from radiation. The point is, it's going there to get information that it's going to retain, and now it can go survey the body, yeah. use that info. Yeah, and it's not there. just because so, I think we talked about like if you have a specific location of radiation that you know the cells in that specific location, say like on your shoulder or in your eye or whatever it is, those cells will then be made known to the immune system. They'll the immune system then knows what to look like when it's a functioning immune system, like you said, and it can move through the rest of the body and essentially inoculate the rest of the body against whatever could be hiding out. And that's called the ab scopal effect. And that's what we try and achieve. So there's, there's, a, there's one more part to it. So if somebody's going for an extended period of time through radiation therapy, the, the, the 
just the virtue of the radiation, the biological effects of that much radiation on the body cause an inflammatory biophysiological response that can, I say, put a biochemical wall between the target and the immune system. So we may be over here having an immune system that wants to get in, but it can't get through the door. Hmm. So we try and break down the door or prevent the door from even being there, still have the dying cancer cells. So you have a functional immune system that can come in and do its job. So how do we do that? Exercise, sleep, hydration, good food, well thinking, everything I just listed, and a host of supplements. Absolutely. Because there are various steps to the immune system and we have to respect each step. You hmm. can't get from point A to point F without going through B, C, D, and E. No, that makes sense for sure. For the most part, for the most part. I mean, <laughs> for the most part, there, there are a few, yeah. you know, shortcuts that you can find. It's the of. human body. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's the human body and it's got, it's, it's got, um, patterns. And I think those patterns are so powerful to find. Um, so let's just talk briefly, like kind of overarching as we close, um, who in your opinion can benefit from integrative oncology and from seeing a naturopathic oncologist? I mean, is it just the patient who has no evidence of disease? Is the, is it the patient, you know, anywhere along the spectrum? Like, what do you think? Well, I was going to say anybody that carries the diagnosis of cancer is sort of anywhere in that continuum could benefit because it, from a prevention of recurrence to an active treatment, to interim treatment, to sort of, hey, I just want to feel better, to, hey, this chemo and this biological, this isn't working. I need, I need something else to make so they can all work better together. Mm. There's even the pre- prevention of cancer in the first place. I mean, that that's something that we do. People have a you know, high family or a uh, pretty in-depth family history or they're a high yeah. risk for uh, a tumor or they have, a, you know, genetics that say that they're probably yeah, going like to get a high it. Risk. We would in- yeah. And the other people that can benefit from it are the family members who are their caretakers. The whole mm-hmm. notion that it takes a village to take care of somebody, they can benefit from that visit. Why? Because if I help them help that person, it's treating everybody. So it's... It's hard to think of a person who can't benefit. I use that example of the person with breast cancer who had the surgery, who goes on the antiestrogen, who may end up being cured and not visit the naturopathic you know, oncologist. But what if that person has other health issues that may put them in jeopardy because the biochemistry of cardiovascular disease or obesity or some or pulmonary disease create, it's one body. Mm-hmm. You could create the same physiology that could support the growth of cancer, but it comes from a non-malignant source. So or, yeah, from really a different can, source uh, for sure. No, that makes yeah. sense. And and I think kind of what you had talked about too, like about just getting that body in that state of homeostasis, that kind of state of alignment, and then just watching for those patterns of when it starts to go, you know, different directions and then addressing when it does, uh, addressing it specifically based on that person with your experience with, you know, like you said, the creativity and kind of the innovation of the problem solving of, okay, this number three months ago was this, and now three months later, it's this what changed and talking and having that conversation about, okay, like the diet changed, the lifestyle changed, stress levels, like any of those things. I think all of those pieces of the story, like you said, that that's, that whole story is so important to how you make a decision as a doctor. Um, and, yeah. um, I guess the only, the other kind of couple things that I wanted to cover is what are, what are your suggestions, um, for someone you know, obviously not everyone is in Arizona, not everyone lives like where I live and is close to where you are. Um, you mentioned there are uh, other FABNOs who typically that's all they do is they focus on the cancer realm. But how do you suggest that someone go about, you know, vetting uh, a naturopathic oncology practice and just determining if they think it's a good fit and if they are um, a good care practice, if that makes sense? You know, that's really difficult for me to say because I don't do that. But if somebody's achieved FABNO, then, the, you know, they, they're equally certified as mm-hmm. I am or, or, you know, boarded. And so I would say that they're a good practice and we generally, yeah. you know, most know each other. I mean, they're a licensed physician. They're board certified in naturopathic oncology. Then you just have to go and consult. Well, you look at their website. I mean, when our new patients inquire here, they go through extensive question and answer. They spend time on the phone before they commit to a consult. And then we see people as new patients. We do a lot of telemedicine. So if people feel like I or Dr. Coates or, or Dr. Elshuler jive with them in terms of podcasts or media that they've watched and they live in Idaho, then that may become my patient. We can do telemedicine. And then they may have a local naturopathic doctor mm. who could facilitate 
the treatments under our guidance, for instance. Or we, we always we love when it's in person and you can have somebody you know close to you because it's it's always you know a more it's generally a more rich experience. Um, but I think get a feel for the practice. And then the other thing is you go for the first consult. And if you guys don't match up, then you try. Yeah. You know? Well, and that's that's the case for any doctor, right? I mean, you you go to the any eye doctor service. for the first time, any service. And if you yeah. don't jive well with that person, then you find a different doctor. Yeah. That's that's what the whole getting a second yeah. opinion is. Um, so then I guess that's before I address one of the questions in the audience. Um, what about like, let's talk a little about the affordability. I know you mentioned protecting the public and you mentioned that idea of like just the, the this is an investment. Um, but let's talk about like the affordability of integrative cancer care, like of seeing a naturopathic oncologist on top of, you know, your medical your medical doctor that you are seeing. Um, and are there any ways that, you know, people can get started where it is less of a financial burden? Cause I know that that is definitely a question that comes up a lot in our community specifically because we have a rare cancer. And so a lot of times insurance is fighting for even just conventional treatments. Um, and so obviously, um, I don't think most insurances go to a naturopathic oncologist and are, you know, partnered with you guys, but, um, what do you see oncologists in your field doing to kind of make their practice affordable and, and attainable for patients? It is not something I would feel comfortable answering. It's not a part of the practice that I manage. I stay specifically, I stay out of that. Our uh, philosophy here at Naturopathic Specialists is it's my job to recommend the best care. It's not my job to know what people's financial situations are. It's our staff's job. And that's why our tagline is personalized medicine, personalized care. Medicine is when we're talking and I deliver my medicine. Care is everything else that happens. And mm -hmm. so we work through our staff. So I'm not the person to be able to talk about our practice and specifically about everybody else's practice and how they run that. I don't know. No, that's, that's a good point. Like it is very individual from practice to practice. Um, uh, we're, sorry, I'm like, my contact is getting blurry for a second. It's probably moved. It got sticky. Um, and then I think we kind of already talked about this, but just generally the pros and cons of like those do it yourself methods on the internet. Um, I think just to kind of reiterate that is just the danger of that is not getting that individualized care. The pros can be that wrong. you maybe you, well, yeah, or that it could be wrong, but the pros can be that, you know, you do get started on a healthier lifestyle and you make some of those shifts before you even come into the office. Um, mm -hmm. just to kind of recap that, I guess we already talked about that. Um, so I did have one question that I saw from the audience. Um, what do you see, like in you've, you said you've been practicing naturopathic oncology for, was it 26, 27 years, roughly? Yeah, 26. Yeah. 26 years. Um, do you see like a pattern or a shift in the mindset of, um, the non-traditional or the conventional oncology medicine? Do you see, you know, conventional doctors who are more willing to have their patients also coming to see an naturopathic oncologist. Um, do you still, I don't know, I yeah, guess, what have, what have you seen in the pattern uh, of over history? Oh, we have seen, we have seen a, a great shift. So back in the day and I, you know, the late nineties, early two thousands. And when I really set out on the mission for integrative medicine, uh, that's kind of partly what I was sort of known in the field for. And I was on many stages and presented many times on how to integrate. And I often said, learn the principles and practice of oncology, be open, share your notes, don't hide your protocols, follow science, follow the patient. And it works. And you get welcomed into the greater community of medicine, which is where we are. And which is why your doctor referred you or a doctor would refer. So, I mean, so the the idea is that there has been a huge shift. There's been sort of a changeover. Some doctors who didn't necessarily appreciate what we do have retired. Others that are a little bit have you know that are younger and maybe have grown up with this this mindset or they've been introduced to it you know in school because now there's a better nutrition course or because of social media just because it's all over the place or because it's in my opinion the right thing to do. There's more of them out there and they understand that. But I'm seeing a shift backwards now. As of the last 18 months, there's a shift backwards. And I don't know if this is because a lot of the crap that's out there on social media and medical oncologists or radiation oncologists or whatever are seeing their patients come in with having problems being like, oh, there's a toxic substance or you should have been taking this. There's starting to be a shift backwards. And I have a sense it's because of the hype that's out there that's not necessarily protecting the public. 
Mm. And it's, but so this gets to be a very big subject. So the answer to your question is, it is a shifting back and forth phenomenon and uh, we're on top of it. No, I think that's, that's a good point. And so in your experience in treating over the last 26 years, do you find that some of the patients that you're able to treat kind of the best are the ones that you are able to have, you know, the patient is working closely with their oncologist and they're also working closely with their naturopathic oncologist. Like there's that communication happening. Uh, I guess my, my question is, do you think that communication is valuable? Well, it is valuable, but that doesn't, the person that I can work with the best is the person who's motivated and is follows. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I can't work with somebody who doesn't follow through. And there's plenty of people who, well, just what I said. Well, yeah, well, that, that is important because, you know, coming to, and I, 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 it's tricky, right? Because going to chemotherapy, say every week for a weekly infusion or an immunotherapy infusion is hard work, right? It is physical hard work for your body. And and you've talked a little about that, how, how that can, that can really just make your body really tired. It can leave you fatigued. It can leave you nutritionally deficient. Like there's so many different layers to that level of care and even radiation. Like, um, there's just a lot of the side effects that come with that, but it also on the flip side is a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of dedication, um, a lot of learning to happen to then implement things that will kind of combat those side effects or that will help kind of, um, what's the word, complement those other treatments. If you're having, you know, kind of simultaneous, say you're doing ozone therapy and you're also having immunotherapy, like I'm not saying that ever happens. That's just a, you know, remind or a random, random hypothetical, but, but there's, there is hard work to be done by the patient, the person who is coming in to see the naturopathic doctor. Like it's, it's not just, it's not just a handful of supplements and you're just taking a bazillion different things and then you're, you're fine. It's, it's, there's a huge level of personal learning that happens, um, from a patient perspective. And I think well that said. that is, that's important to recognize. Right. And it's, it's not going to be for everybody, but it is, I think so powerful for the patient and so empowering. And I think that if we can just empower mm-hmm. patients that, like you said, the immune system listens to our brains, it listens to what we think that's that in and of itself, like just finding ways to find hope and finding belief that things are going to improve in your whole body system, like is so powerful when you're combating cancer. Awesome. Well, Dr. Grubin, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and and call it for the day. I feel like we've used up enough of your time and I know you have other plans and other, other things to get to. Um, but is there thank anything you. that you want to end with as we kind of close out? I've said it. If people have listened to this podcast, they I've opened up, I've given you my personal slash professional opinions. I've tried to tell you what it's like out there. We're every day in the trenches with patients doing this. We've seen the ebb and flow of what's going on. We are careful. We are integrative and we're here to protect the public and do what's best for each individual patient. And it is a lot of work. Like you said, it's a lot of work on our end. It's a lot of work on the patient's end because they got to, they got to facilitate what we've suggested to do, but it's very enriching. And I really appreciate giving, uh, you giving me the opportunity to talk about these things and for your audience to, uh, uh, be there to engage. Well, I am so appreciative and I'm grateful, grateful that I have you as my own doctor, but I'm just grateful that you were willing to come and speak on the podcast with us. So thank you so much. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us today on the I Believe podcast brought to you by Castle Biosciences. Please be sure to subscribe. And if you're so inclined, send this episode over to friends, family, and share on your social media to help spread awareness around OM. If you have a moment, Leave us a brief review or consider making a donation to the links in the show notes to keep our podcast going. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Acure Insight. We'll see you next time on the I Believe podcast.